What's going on, y'all? Hope everybody's well. Welcome back to the Onyx Report, Black Masculinist News for the day. Hope y'all are good. Shout out to Ron. What's going on? Um, got a special treat uh, today. A good friend of mine. We were having a discussion after <clears throat> last week's broadcast where we went in and talked a little bit about Black men reimagining child support. And as some of my most consistent uh, listeners know, we have started a 14 point black male political agenda. And the first point on that agenda is a reevaluation of family court or basically dealing with family court reform. I will put that link in the chat for you all to consider, especially if you haven't seen it. I still have a couple things to add to it since the last show, and I was asked to put it in a PDF format. So I will be doing that shortly as well. Uh, it's just been pretty time consuming. Uh, shout out to uh, Yoga Yoga. Shout out to Donnie. What's going on? AKs and Curtains. What's up? Y'all know the deal. Like, share, subscribe, join, and donate. Support the channel if you will. You can see on the screen, you can do that through uh, you know Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, or Patreon. And if you go to Patreon, you can not only become a monthly supporter, you can also choose to support the Institute for Black Male Studies. And so there are options there to support along both fronts. So make sure you support what we're trying to do so black male media can actually grow and we can have an independent space to talk about the issues that matter to us without being supervised and told what's acceptable for black men to ponder and what shouldn't be pondered. Uh, Y'all know that's where they're trying to go with this. I do understand there's a number of broadcasts going on right now, but uh, we got to get this in because I think it's important. And my brother had some very interesting experiences that uh, I wanted to share going back a ways. So I'm going to go ahead and bring him up. He's also known as, uh, he's known as, as Jellaba Baba. He's also known as Baba the Storyteller, internationally renowned storyteller. Um, one of the most successful brothers that I know, but also, um, you know, coming from a background of a lot of adversity. So I'm going to go ahead and bring him in. So we can get this discussion, this, this, the discussion started. Brother Jellaba, what's up, man? I'm good, brother. Thanks for having me. Hey, man. Thank you for coming through, especially on relative, uh, relatively short notice. But, it's uh, Dr. Johnson. Who does not show up for Dr. Here Johnson? Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> here you go. We, we, I think we're going uh, at a time where there's a lot of, uh, well, it's a combination of there's a lot of good, you know, a lot of good content creators going right now. And I've been shadow banned by YouTube, so... You know, I, I think a lot of the a lot of people will end up seeing it a little bit later. But either way, um, I want to get started on this because we were talking, as we usually do, uh, mm -hmm. about our lives, our backgrounds, and in regard to family court and so on and so forth. Um, your story goes back to the 1980s, right? And you went through a you know a uniquely experience you know, because a lot of brothers that are grappling with it are grappling with it within the last few years, um, but. You know, I wanted a chance to talk with you about what you experienced from the 1980s onward in, in terms of this. So if you would um, tell us, you know, the number of times you've been married, tell us how many kids you have. And let's start back with your introduction to family court. Right. Let me. OK, let me lay this out first, because this this is uh, something in almost 40 something years. Yeah. I have never talked about. Mm. And the reason why I've never talked about it is because as a black man, our conditioning is to suffer in silence, is right. not to put things out, don't air other people's dirty laundry, don't. But what I'm finding is that the necessity of communicating mm -hmm. uh, is it's real because there are a lot of brothers who are suffering. Yeah. And if we hold on to whatever information we have, we're whatever has gotten us from point A to point B, and we don't share that with other brothers, right. then we're allowing that suffering to continue. Mm -hmm. So this moment, I'm actually breaking through a lot of my own conditioning to be able to even talk about this right now. Right. And it, I'm gonna be honest with you, some of it's still a little uncomfortable. Right. But um, I know enough to know that there are people suffering and if I can offer a grain that might help someone, then this, this is what it's going to be. All okay. right. Um, okay. But look, we could start in so many different places, but here's where I'm going to start. Mm -hmm. I was a teen father. Okay. Right? 
um, I had my first child at 19 years old. Mm. And when, when I had my first child at 19, my conditioning or the way that I, I was brought up down south, I'm from Texas. I was born mm -hmm. in Texas. Mm -hmm. The way I was brought up, it was if, or if you get a girl pregnant, you're marrying her. Right, right, right. All right. So there were no options in my mind to not marry. It was like that was what men did. And right. we were measured by that standard. Yeah. And if, I, if I'm go if I'm old enough to engage in uh, the sexual act, then I'm old enough to accept responsibility for it. So I married. Mm -hmm. I married. Um, I think and I've in my lifetime, I've been married three times. So okay. I'm. I'm in my third marriage right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if I go back, I think I was, I wasn't prepared mm -hmm. in any way, shape or form right. for what this system has in store for yeah. black men. Yeah, I, I wasn't prepared, brother. And honestly, I'm lucky to be alive and to have gotten through it today. But what motivated me uh, during those years was I I had this vision in my mind that I had to be a father to my children mm -hmm. because I was about breaking the race racist stereotypes. I was about being a real man. I was about to, it was like, you know, what we the John Henry thing that we talk yeah. about, right? Yeah. Especially in the in the conscious slash nationalist community, that's what we were trained to do. Right. Yeah. And my life did not matter right. in that. It right. did not matter. What yeah. mattered was what I could provide. Right. Uh, so I did, I mean, brother, <laughs> I, I, I damn near killed myself working from 19 because the other narrative was no one else is going to take care of my children. Right, right. You know, my kids. Right. Right? right. So I, um, I think I'm going to I'm going to fast forward because if you have questions, I can I can bounce around. But we're talking about right. like a lot of years. So, right. um, well, okay, well, let me ask you this. Uh, so you got married at young. Mm -hmm. you, what, what age were you when you actually married? So she was pregnant at 19. You were 19. You Did you marry her that same year? Sure did. OK, so you married her in, in, in and, uh, you know, you moved in together and you're starting to build this kind of family situation. Uh, what would you say about early marriage? How, how did that work? <laughs> Um, for me, and th these are the things that I've avoided talking about, but now it's just, if it helps a brother out, it will help a brother. Um, my, um, first marriage was highly dysfunctional. Okay. Highly dysfunctional. I am a very, um, easygoing, peaceful brother. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, but I can say during that marriage, I was driven, driven to a point of madness. Okay. I was driven to a point, and there's a lot of brothers who are going to understand this, of mm -hmm. contemplating things that I did not think I was capable of. Right. So I suffered a high degree of um, interpersonal part violence, IPV. I, I suffered violence, yeah. Degree. I mean, without getting into details, I mean, I had knives. This is for my wife. I'm talking about for my first wife. I had knives pulled on me, mm. um, trying to run me over with a car, um, trying to poison me. Uh, I, I could go on with the list, right? But in spite of all that, if I were a better man, I would not have been suffering these things. That was the concept I was dealing with. Yeah. No matter no matter what she did, if I were a better man, right, then these things would fall into place. So when she no, attacked you with a knife, your thought process was she must have done it because I wasn't being a good enough, strong enough man. Maybe I needed to work a third job. Right. Maybe right, right, right. you know the the fights over Christmas because she couldn't get the toys that. Uh, she wanted or buy the gifts or it's like i you know it was all those things it's like well you know brothers are like well, you know what maybe she's got a point um mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. most brothers are highly introspective mm -hmm. highly introspective and we usually come from an internal like central locus of control mm -hmm. not not an external one mm -hmm. so usually our internal locus of control tells us that if we make internal changes then we can change the environment outside of us. Right. 
that's how powerful brothers believe that we believe ourselves to be. Mm -hmm. But um, it was to the point where she even went to, I mean, she attacked me in front of police officers and went to jail. Okay, wait, now <laughs> tell us that story. Okay. What, how did that day come about? What what happened? It, if you can. It, it sounds so ridiculous to repeat. Now she's but, like, you know. but but here's here's what happened. I I had worked a 12 hour shift and I went home. I was exhausted and she wanted to talk. Now how old was she? Um we were both at that time about 20. Okay. About 20, 21, somewhere mm -hmm. around there. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to talk, but, but I was I was literally falling asleep. Remember, I said I was working two jobs and I was coming from one of them where I had worked 12 hours on it. Yeah. I literally was like nodding out. Mm -hmm. And at one point I, I was nodding out and she started screaming and, and yelling. And I was like, oh, the kid, you know, at that time I had two kids. By the time I had two. So I was like, oh, the kids, you know, calm this down. What do you like? I'm, I'm trying to manage this. Right. Mm -hmm. But the neighbors call the police. OK. So there's a knock at the door and I'm like, damn, you know, I'm all messed up. I'm tired. I, I'm not even thinking straight. She's at me. I, I go answer the door and the, the police are like, sir, step outside. And I'm like, oh, damn. You know, it's like I'm I'm going through it. Right. Mm -hmm. She literally with the cops outside. Like, wait, let me preface this. They were about to cuff me and take me away. Wow. They were about to cuff me and take me away. And I, I literally had not done anything. But he, with the cops outside, she ran out of the house. And at that time, we had um, glass baby bottles. Mm. <laughs> she runs out with a glass baby bottle and starts, like, hitting me in my head. And the cops take a beat. They're looking at this, and nobody can believe what's happening, right? And I'm like, if I put my hands on this woman, mm -hmm. right, right away, like no matter what she's doing, if I put my hands on her, I'm out. I'm like, they're going to take, I'm gone. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, protecting myself, you know, and I'm walking, running, dodging, trying to get away from the baby bottle. <laughs> right, right, right. And um, the cops finally grab her and take her, put her in the car, they cuff her, take her away. Um, but she got out that same night. They they didn't press charges. They weren't going to press charges or anything. <laughs> she got out the same night. <laughs> she got out the same night. We but, were talking about that shit still happening. <laughs> this was the late 80s. This, this might have been about 85, 86, somewhere around there. Okay. But anyway, let me fast forward because I think what you're interested in is the family court dynamic, mm. like what I was going through. But anyway, I knew I wasn't going to be in that marriage. Right. And I filed for divorce. Okay. And I could not afford uh, an attorney. Mm. And at the time, there was no internet. Mm. So I, I spent hours in the library. And they had these books called Nolo Press Books back in the day. Okay. And I researched how to file for divorce, how to file for custody, how to all this stuff. And I spent hours in the library filling out my paperwork, doing everything, right? Until I felt like I had gotten it right. And I filed for divorce. She up and left, went back to the East Coast, and I was left with the kids. Oh, wow. Okay. I was left with the kids. So um, long story short, and I think this is where the twist happens, right? I had custody of my kids for a few years and she wasn't around. Mm -hmm. um, she had come back like trying to gain custody, but it, it wasn't working because she didn't have the money. She left and didn't have the money to come back, right? Okay. So it was a financial thing. Um, and I had gotten with another woman um, at that time. And <laughs> at that time, I was working two jobs, both <laughs> jobs as a security guard. And okay. this is important. This is important because you like to think I'm the most successful brother on the planet. But we all have beginnings. That's right. I, I was working as a security guard. And here's the part that you'll be interested in. Here's where I lost custody. Mm. This is when I lost custody. I was with a woman. And I was working these two jobs in security and I was going to school. Okay. And I was going. To, so you know what that's like, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I still had that same mindset, take care of my family. You know. So the woman I was with at the time was upset that I wasn't home. Mm. 
she was also upset that like there wasn't enough money coming in right and approached me and said you're working too hard you don't have to work this hard you're going to school you're working two jobs and i was like well what else could i do she said well you could apply for welfare oh, okay 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 and i got i was like no mm -hmm. uh -uh. ain't happening mm -hmm. not happening i can work i can do so we fought for a year over that topic okay a year we fought for over a year over that topic and uh i i acquiesced i was like you know what i think i was like 23 or 24 at the time i was like damn okay look we don't need to fight over this anymore tell me what to do and she knew it she knew boom. it all yeah she knew it all was like boom 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 go here do this do this do that yep. and so i was like well I don't have enough time. I'm working these two jobs. She's like, no, go to school and get on this. And you explain to me, you can go to school on this, raise your kids, get your degree. And I was like, no, no, ain't no way in hell. <laughs> ain't no way in hell that you're going to tell me that I can stop working, go on welfare, um, collect money, go to college, get my degree and move mm -hmm. on. It was a fantasy. It was like, not a fantasy it was bizarre it was otherworldly to me mm -hmm. so um i instead of arguing i acquiesced i went through this process it was a humiliating process because there were no other men in yeah. this process <laughs> when I was going through this. right no other men right and most of the people i came across like in the process were sisters like who were managing these uh social service areas and every time i walked through the door it was like I got looks. I got come back another time. It, it, it was it was humiliating. Yeah, it was humiliating. Yeah. But I was in my early twenties, trying to work this relationship. Finally, got on um, welfare, AFDC. I think, yeah. yeah, I think that's what it's called. Yeah, whatever. But here I am, and then they told me, "Well, how many hours are you work?" And I'm like, "As many as I can." They go, well, "We're going to cut how much money you get." And I was like, but I got two kids and my, you know, my girl is telling me this, this, and this. like, you have to work less. You can't, I'm like, this is some crazy stuff. Right. This is some crazy stuff. So in the midst of all of this, my ex comes back. Now she has some support. She files for custody. We go to court. I'm standing in court and this white judge is sitting up there and he doesn't take but 10 minutes. Mm. He's like, I see you're on welfare. I said, yes, your honor. I'm also going to school. I also have another job instead of two jobs. And I'm trying to explain. And my girl is sitting over here. She's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my ex is sitting over to the side. So the judge goes, you look like an able-bodied man. And I was like, yes, your honor, I am. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, why can't you take care of your family? Yeah, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And the next thing I know, judgment yep. for the plaintiff. Yep. And she got the kids and the kids were in the hallway. I didn't even get to see my kids, brother. She went out and she had a cousin or somebody with her. They snatched the kids. They left. The judge kept me in the courtroom. I couldn't leave. The, and it was like my world was spinning. And I'm looking at my girl who like told right. me to file for uh yep. um it, welfare. Uh, welfare yeah damn see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and i'm looking at my world is just spinning right mm -hmm. and i'm looking and i'm like you and i'm thinking you but that i can't blame her because well because they can roll like that you but can't i made i made the decision under duress or not I'm the one who made the decision. So there goes that internal locus of control. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to listen to her. I would still have my kids if mm -hmm. I had followed my own. Why didn't I? So, but she was to blame partially. <laughs> but we don't do that. We, right? don't, do we that. don't do that. We don't do that. Right. Yeah. So that was one of the most embarrassing moments in my life, brother. One of the most humiliating moments. Having that white man sit up there and tell me the things that he said. I can't. It, it was just humiliating. So you with me, right? Oh, yeah. So I'm sitting in that courtroom. My world is spinning. It's like a Spike Lee movie, man, where it's rocking, right? Mm -hmm. And I decide in that moment, I remember thinking, 
whatever I have got to do, mm -hmm. I'm getting my kids back. Okay. Um, and my motivation was I was not going to be one of those grown men 20 years later who when right. kid shows up on your doorstep. Right, right. And, right. you know, because I knew what she, I knew how she was going to program my children. Yes. Right. So here I was a security guard. Six weeks I was on welfare. Six weeks. I can tell you to this day, six mm. weeks. Mm. I cut that off. I went and got my two jobs. I started researching how to fight for custody. She was on the East Coast, what I needed to do. So I went and I got enough money to consult an attorney who told me, you got to make time with your kids. You got to see your kids. You got to do this. You got to do that. I'm like, I don't have any money. Mm. He said, well, I don't know what to tell you. And he just wow. sat back and looked at me. Yep. So here's what I did. Once every two months, I started buying plane tickets for once every two months. Mm. And I would stay at least two weekdays on the East Coast so that I could visit the school so that they would know my face. I was hustling, brother. Mm -hmm. I was hustling. I was making decisions sometimes whether to have food yes. or yeah. money to pay for those plane tickets to go see my kids. And I was also paying child support, right? There's so much to this story, but I'm gonna fast forward a little more. Okay. So here I am fighting for custody because I started fighting for custody on the East Coast, South Carolina. And I'm flying back and forth. And I'm a minimum wage brother. Right. You hear me? Right. I'm a minimum wage brother eating bologna sandwiches. Or when I couldn't afford it, sometimes it was just bologna with no bread. You know? I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. But what I was doing was making sure I had the money to get there to fight. Mm -hmm. And I started putting more and more money away. Now, I'm going to tell you, it took me four years of mm -hmm. fighting, but I did not give up. OK, but I reached a point where I hired a private detective. I started researching the people who lived in that community and making friends and getting to know people in that community. Mm -hmm. so they would tell me things when I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. uh, I found out I got real stealth like with this. I found out who her enemies were. <laughs> Damn. I found out uh, who she was sleeping with, whose husband she was sleeping with when she wasn't supposed to. Uh -oh. I, brother, I did what I had to do. And I know this, look, I know how this sounds right now, but you got to realize how I was raised and what, how I was conditioned and what my definition was a man. I was not going to have someone else raise my kids and I was not going to have her poison my children's minds so that I had some 30 year old standing in front of me telling me how worthless I was. Yes. I wasn't going to have it. So, mm -hmm. um, I damn near killed myself. But what I realized is you have got to overwhelm the system to just get an ounce of justice. You okay. have to overwhelm it. If you are not willing to overwhelm it, it will land on top of you and you will be buried under the system. Mm -hmm. so when I walked into court, it, it, it was funny. I hired, I got a female attorney on purpose. Mm -hmm. I hired a female attorney. And I went to this female attorney. It was in South Carolina. And I said, I want you to represent me in this case. I had built my case. I had built my case already. Right. And the first thing this, uh, as a black woman, she told me, she said, you're not going to win this case. Wow. She said, do black you know woman attorney. She said, I'm going to tell you here in Columbia, South Carolina, 95% of the custody goes to the mother. And she said, if you want to waste your money, you go ahead and pay me. Wow. And I told her, I said, yeah, I'm not going to consider it wasting my money because you work for me when I hire you. <laughs> and I said, and I'm going to lay this case out and I'm going to tell you what I need. And I'm going to tell you how we're going to open. And I'm going to tell you what witnesses to call. And I'm, and I, I laid out her entire case mm. and, but we get to court. She was still shaking her head. Right. And I started laying all the stuff out. And she started the evidence, you know, exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C, exhibit B, doom, boom. I was, I was laying, I was working, brother. I was working. So I'm laying all this stuff out. And the judge is up there like looking at all this evidence I'm putting out. Right. Now, what is what is her facial expression look like? The, the attorney? No, your ex. 
My ex was not steeped in reality. Mm. She was not steeped in reality. Okay. Um, she was going to fight this, even though she didn't have the ability to fight it. She, she still, she was just uh, hubris. That's all I can say. Right. Blinded by hubris, almost ego driven. Right. But here's what happened. The judge starts asking all these questions. Right. And one of the, I remember one of the key questions was I had bought in a witness, two teachers from the school. I bought them in from the school. They're on the stand. And I had the question, I had my attorney, I had this list of questions I had my attorney ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions was, can you identify the children's father? And the two teachers were like, yeah, that's him right there. And uh, they said, can you identify the children's mother? And they said, we think that's her sitting over there, but we've never seen her. Ooh. Ooh. Which I knew because they had told me that before. I also bought in a woman who, um, whose husband my ex had been sleeping with. I got a hold of him. I bought him in the court. I think I bought him Burger King that day or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but long story short, because I, I don't, you know, I could go on and on. But <laughs> long story short, I had to become a virtual assassin with the interest of my kids at the forefront of my mind, right. willing to sacrifice whatever I needed to sacrifice. And I knew I needed to overwhelm the system. Brother, mm -hmm. I lived in the library. Okay. I should have a damn law degree. And what's funny is my attorney puffed her chest up as the court, as the hearing was going on, like she had done something. <laughs> it, it, it was, it was, it was comical brother, because here she was with the law degree telling me there was no way I was going to win. And when we started winning, next thing you know, she's like, oh, we're doing good. Well, well, let me, uh, you know, it, it was like she took on the same level of like, look at what I'm doing. I'm like, <laughs> you ain't done nothing. <laughs> you ain't done a damn thing, but read off the paper that I put in front of you. But, but anyway, um, it was in Columbia, South Carolina, that I got custody back of my kids. But okay. it took me four years of fighting. Right. So so they awarded you custody at the end of that particular trial? Or at the that end of that trial, they awarded me custody. And um, along the way, I tried to negotiate peacefully settlement, but it never worked. Um, even her mother, I remember her mother looking at me and was like, when it when when they first took my kids away, she was like, you know, she, it was nasty. I, I I'm not even gonna repeat what she said to me, but it was nasty. And then when it you can, when you I, can repeat that, it if you feel the needs to be repeated. Look, when I started winning the case, uh, her mother came to me and was like, "Listen, we really need to talk, and we got to settle. This is ridiculous. We've been." I'm like, "Oh." I told you this was going to happen, and now it's too late for talking. Uh oh. So I got custody of my kids, came back to California, and raised my kids here in California. Now you got more than custody, though. Yeah, yeah. well, I got child support, um, which was minimal. I, I, I think <laughs> the amount of child support that they gave her—it was like fifty dollars per child—was low in the late eighties. Right. Fifty dollars per child. Come on, man. But the core question is: Did she ever pay it? Um, she actually defaulted for a long period of time, mm -hmm. and ended up having to go to jail. Okay. And her parents had to pay. I had nothing to do with any of this. This was the law in South Carolina, mm -hmm. and they weren't accustomed to a woman not having custody or a woman paying child support. So the court was confused about what they had to do. So uh, they actually ended up putting her away, I think for like a week. And her parents had to get the money together to get her out. Um, a week? Yeah. Wow. You, our reality is not their reality, brother. So when, now you mentioned once uh, there was a moment where you got a call about this child support from a police officer uh, where they were coming at you. And there was no, 
it wasn't a police officer. It was the, dis- it was the district attorney's office. And it was f- what I found out. The call I got, I had my kids back in California. It was like a year later. Mm-hmm. Um, and I get this call on uh, landline because cell phones wasn't out by that time. <laughs> so I, I pick up the phone. And it's like, uh, you know, you owe. And he starts going off all this money. And, you know, we're coming after you. And you can go to jail for this. And um, and he's starting to tell me about what a disgusting person I am for not taking care of my kids, what a deadbeat I am. And he's going on and on. And that uh, the the state providing money for my kids when I should be. And he's saying all this stuff. Mm-hmm. This was a year after I got custody. Right. And I'm I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? So I said, hold on. Hold on. He's like, no, you're not going to interrupt me. It was a district attorney's office where they go after people who default on um, welfare or something like that. So what I, fu- what I found out after talking in, I, like I finally calmed him down, was like, I have custody of my children and I've had custody for the past year. And he was like, oh, um, um, this isn't what it says on my paperwork here. Uh, do, do you have any evidence of that? And I was like, fool, who are you? And why don't you have your stuff together? So anyway, I'm communicating with him and come to find out that my ex, even without having the children, had been collecting welfare. And they were charging that against me. She was claiming she was defrauding the government. Wow. And she was claiming to have had the children with her when they were with me for the entire year. So um, they were coming after me under the assumption that the mother had custody of right. the children. The assumption. That's all they needed was the assumption because if the system believes that mothers have children for the most part. Right. So. Right. See, and I want to clarify uh, the importance of this story, right? Because uh, we're talking about a successful business businessman who starts off, you know, as humbly as many of us do. We don't generally have an inheritance. We don't start from wealth. We got to build from the ground up. You're talking about Having, he's he's dealt with intimate partner violence in his relationship. He's dealt with false accusations. He's dealt with frauding the court, not him doing so, but his ex-wife, uh, you know, frauding, uh, uh, you know, uh, welfare and doing so in such fashion where he's considered guilty. He's considered, a, you know, a deadbeat dad by the institutions that he's battling to get custody of his kids. These, the, uh, the reason I raise these things is because when we try to talk about those issues, one of the things I hear from people is that doesn't happen. You guys are just making this up. You're just you just want something to say as if black men don't have these experiences. And when you look in the comments, when you look at you know brothers write in their stories left and right, and yet as far as established institutions are concerned, this doesn't exist. Your experience doesn't exist. This would and if it does, it's just something you as an individual went through. It's not really something black men experience. Let me let me add to this because there's so much to, to this story. Mm-hmm. Um, I was steeped in fatherhood in a way that was, I mean, I was I was by my nature. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm an achiever by my mm-hmm. nature. Mm-hmm. And when I started doing all these things back then, it was like the early 90s or so. Um, I got a reputation at that time for what I had done. So I was literally helping other people out, helping brothers, giving workshops. And I I got the attention of the city of Los Angeles. I actually contracted with the city of Los Angeles and became a consultant. And I led the largest, uh, it was called fathering program in the entire nation at Mm. one time. It was very corporate. I mean, it was a double-edged sword. There was some good things. There was some horrible things to it. Mm-hmm. But my experiences led me to become a consultant with the city where I was consulting and helping fathers throughout the corporate arena and not just corporate, but also blue collar. Mm-hmm. So I was working with like water and power and different departments in the city, heading up a brother, heading up the largest fathering program in the nation, Nice in the nation. So it's not like I don't I don't want anyone to think. I guess our stories are complicated, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, you know, here I am, the age that I am now, and we're going back 40 years. 
Right. Right. So where I was in my uh, late teens and, you know, when I was having my first child, where I was in my early 20s, mid 20s, where I was in my 30s and my 40s, 50s. I mean, I was a completely different human being in mm -hmm. those stages. Mm -hmm. And the man I am today is the evolution of all of those young men I was before. Right. 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 So um, I think I want to be. I don't want to. <laughs> I once told this group, I said, look, I'm the, I'm an average brother. And I am. And I honestly believe that to this day. And pe the people are like, oh, no, ain't nothing average about you. You're brilliant. I'm like, no, here's the thing. I believe myself to be an average brother because I believe in brothers. Mm -hmm. I believe myself to be an average brother because I know what the potential of brothers are. Yeah. If unfettered. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, James Brown had that song. I don't want nothing. Just open the door. I'll get it myself. Right, right? Right, right. If 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 society gets out of our way, right, brothers can perform miracles. Mm -hmm. So if well, there's anyone who deserves magic titles, <laughs> well, and, and the question is, how much more can brothers do if they had the same amount of support everybody else got? And a lot of what I was doing was with almost no support. Now. Yeah, now, that first marriage, you really didn't have to deal with family court after that, did you? The first marriage is where I fought for custody. Right. That's okay. where I went through family court. And That's you actually we, got child support in the 80s, which is virtually unheard of. It was it, early 90s. By that time, after fighting for four, four and a half years or five years, it, it went into the early 90s. But yes. Okay. So, um, so after the whole family court debacle, you're raising your kids. Um, let's transition a bit from just the family court experience and talk about uh, relationships, if you will, because you've learned a lot. You've went through a lot in terms of that. So you're out of the first marriage. What do you transition to at that point? You, you, you still have your kids. What goes on in your life from there? At that time, my life was all about my kids. Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing else that I was living for. Uh, even my relationships, like when I when I got with my second wife, the one of the first things I told her was my kids come first. OK, if you can't be in my life, understanding my kids come first, then you can't be in my life. I actually said that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and to her credit, she jumped in and became a mother to my children. She jumped in and did the work. She okay. started doing the work. Um, but. The prob the problem is this, brother. I was not a fully evolved person. Mm -hmm. I was a conditioned being an understanding of this world that was put in place or put upon me by those who reared me, who raised me. And until I broke that cycle, I was not living. Yeah. I wasn't seeing what living was. I wasn't seeing what life was because everything was about sacrifice. And now you were, you know, yeah, just for clarity, you were raised in a predominantly female led family, right? Yes. Yeah. So predominantly, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You grew, you grew up with aunties. Um, I had some uncles who were around, but the day to day uh, involvement right. with the children were the women in the family. What would yeah. you say the, the ongoing or the overall perspective was on not only black males, but even you in oh, your wow. family? Damn. What was what would you say the the most consistent perspective was on black Brother, men? You, okay, you're hurting me right now, mm -hmm. because when you said that, there's something that popped into my mind, mm -hmm. and I almost don't want to say it. It's one of those things. It's like when you ask me that, there's a mantra, right? Niggas ain't shit. Yeah. While you're talking, that yeah. mantra jumps to the forefront of my mind. I think I heard that more than the Bible or <laughs> than I did uh, the work in school or songs on the radio. Or <laughs> I think that mantra played out in my mind more than anything else when I was coming up. And I don't I don't I might have to sit with that a little bit, because while you were talking, I'm thinking, why the hell is that coming up in the forefront of my brain? But when you're asking me about the women I was raised around and grew up around. That's the mantra that comes to mind. Well, it, you know, did they have a respect for men, even men that they 
dated or were around? What you know? What did you notice? There weren't many men um, around, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the men who were around sort of modeled the behavior that I spoke about when we first started talking. Sort of like that John Henry, you know. Mm-hmm. Like I had a I had a stepfather. I remember I had a stepfather who came home one day, and I we were in Detroit. We were living in Detroit. And he's standing outside the house. My mother tells him she she can't let him in until he cleans off. But he takes off these goggles and he's got this black soot all Mm. over his face. He's Mm. covered in all this black ash and soot. And as he's walking, it's like falling off of him. Right. And I'm like, what? Where did he just come from Mm -hmm. to take care of this family? He was working in these steel mills or something like that. Mm putting his life on the line. Mm -hmm. Now, I was not his child, Mm -hmm. but he stepped into that role and put his life on the line. Where he was working, what I found out later, where he was working, each day he potentially could have lost his life in the mills where he was working. Yeah. So that was my model. And he wasn't ever, he wasn't very present because he was too busy. Now, he was too busy putting his life on the line to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. So you see what my model was. But he couldn't even come in the house. Well, not until he changed. You know, it was like he had to get rid of all that stuff. (laughs) That was it. it, 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 Yeah. Yeah, brother. So, So coming from that kind of environment, did you notice any symmetry in the women you chose? To be with was there any yeah. connection between the women you were raised with and the women you chose to have in your life i chose women incapable of seeing me okay i chose women who i could uh be in service to i chose women who i could if need be rescue i chose i chose women based on not what i needed but that they needed me mm-hmm yeah, that, their value as a man was in how well you could take care of a sister in need, in every way, shape, and form of relationships, right. whether it be social, sexual, you name it. That is the value uh, mm-hmm. that had been placed in those relationships. Now, how successful would you say you were starting with the second marriage uh, in terms of being able to provide, protect, so on and so forth? I, I would say, because that's when I started moving more toward the corporate realm. For those years that I was in the corporate, corporate realm, if you say economically, I was economically uh, successful. Mm-hmm. But I was dying inside. Uh, I remember waking up every day and just being like cussing. Mm. Like I had to go into this corporate gear because it was sucking the life out of me. Mm-hmm. I had to go in and literally pretend to be someone other than who I was okay. in order to be, to move through this corporate maze. Right. So, and what we call successfully. Mm-hmm. And I remember at a certain point, I remember turning to my second wife and saying, I'm not, I, I can't do this. Mm. I can't do this. And she was like, well, what are you going to do? And I remember I said, I'm going to be a storyteller. Right. <laughs> right. And we were in the car. And I remember it was like it just dead silence. Right. Mm-hmm. And she's looking at me. Now, when I say this, when I say storyteller, there's so much more to it mm-hmm. than storyteller. And I thought she was aware of what I was talking about because I had set these things in motion long before leaving mm-hmm. corporate. Mm-hmm. Like I took five years to transition out of corporate. I made a business plan. I right. I put a lot of things in place. I didn't right. just one day up and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to be a storyteller. I'm an artist walking out the door. And no, no, I didn't because I still had a family to care for. Right. Mm-hmm. But the the insanity for me was I had put things in place and I transitioned well. I began mm-hmm. to make more money uh, doing the storytelling things that I was doing, the educational things, the teaching, the, the workshop. The, I, I began making more money doing that than I was uh, in the corporate realm. 
Well, and you're also you're you're also a musician, so you play an instrument an instrument that maybe you know only one or two other people in the country. <laughs> There's probably a few more who play it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. And you 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 know that's you and I both know it ain't many if it, if that many at all. Look, brother. Yes. Okay, but that was part of my business plan. I I I wasn't a musician out of like it's music in my soul. It was like, here are the things I need to put in place to be successful. So I trained myself in music, right? I trained myself in languages. I trained, yeah, I trained myself in those things. But here's the point I was going to make. Um, in spite of more money coming in, here was the problem. With the corporate thing, money was coming in every two weeks. Mm -hmm. With the business I had created for myself, money was not coming in regularly. It was coming in in larger amounts. It needed to be managed differently, but it right. wasn't coming in regularly. And that was the problem. One of the problems that she had was like, we can't depend on this coming out. I'm like, but look. I'm making more. I'm making more and we're living. Mm -hmm. I'm, not only are we living, we're thriving. But there was something about that that she couldn't quite get past. And I think the thing that broke us apart, me, broke me, was one day she looks at me and she says, this is after years of supporting and doing everything, right? She looks at me and says, when are you going to get a real job? Mm. Mm. And I'm yeah. looking around the house we had. I'm, I'm looking, we got cars yeah. and, I'm, and, and, and I'm, I'm like food in the fridge and uh, like bills paid. And I'm like, now let's, what are let's, you talking about? But let's be clear. So you, you, you play an instrument that only a, a couple of people in the country may play. You went to Africa to study yeah. how to play it. You yeah. actually have a book on this, right? Yeah, I'll toss it up here for you. So okay. yeah, I really did cool. write a book called Road of Ash and Dust about my first experience in uh, Africa and learning this tradition. I think I don't want to undersell. I don't want to undersell this. Um, there's a tradition that we as ADOS bought over here with us. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't come over here empty minded, empty handed. So when you hear rappers, rap, preachers talk, when you hear people spin and spit, and when you hear like your Richard Wrights and you read Black Boy and you, when you're or Baldwin, when you're into all of these things, those are all coming from a spoken word tradition. But what I'm getting at though, is you travel to Africa with, you know, you're, you're building your repertoire. How many languages did you teach yourself to speak? Um, before, okay, five. Okay. So I'm, I'm, wait, I'm fluent in five, but for me, fluent means you can speak, read, write, understand Id idiomatic expressions and know uh, okay. history in the code. Yeah, so for me, fluency is a little bit different. Amen. So, so in the midst of grappling with trying to get your wife to understand this new plan, breaking from the security of the corporate model and delving into the insecurity of being an independent businessman of your own, you're also teaching yourself languages and your your standard for how to speak them is beyond the norm. For most people, as long as they can know a few phrases and communicate back and forth, that's the standard. But you're doing this to perform in different languages and you're doing this with the specific goal of being able to open up whole countries where you can perform. And I can just say you, you've been successful in that. You you How many co countries have you performed? Oh, in? wow. I in you want past, brother? I've been doing this for twenty-seven years. Right. I, uh, how many countries have I been to? Mm -hmm. I honestly, I don't even know. I've gone through three passports. Okay, so you you perform you all over the world. I, okay, I can say this: I performed in every single country in South America. I, I visited every country in Central America. Um, I've toured South, all, like I said, South America, uh, Mexico. I've toured all over Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. <clears throat> Um, West Africa. I've even gone back to Africa to teach in schools. I've mm -hmm. been hired to come back and teach in schools. So, I, I mean, when you Asia. say how many countries, it's kind of like, yeah. I honestly don't know. Asia? Yes. I, I've been to Beijing. Yeah. I've, you performed in, see, and that's what, so, so what I'm getting at is you built all of these things up. Would you say that 
um, you were well supported in terms of understanding where you were trying to transition, not only yourself, but to your, your family too. On, I'm, and being honest with you, I had the illusion of support. I had the illusion of support. I had convinced myself that I was being supported. But in actuality, I was fighting against a lack of support. The words came out and I wanted to believe the words that I heard, right? So I fought and I struggled, but it reached a point where I, I, I was constantly stagnating. And I'm like, what the hell? I know I'm better than this. And I would push and I would stagnate. I'm like, I know I should be growing. And I would, and I wasn't growing. And I realized, I said, uh, that internal locus of control kicked in. Mm. This relationship is going to keep me from getting where I need to be. They're asking in the chat what instrument you play. It's called the Kora. It's right. the K-O-R-A. For those familiar with it, it comes from the griot tradition. So when, if you remember roots, Alex Haley went back to West Africa. He went to the Gambia. And the oral historians who shared their uh, his history, who matched Kunta Kinte's history back with the continent, they told the history while playing one of these instruments. And I've always been fascinated by history. So I went back to Africa to learn that instrument, not to be a musician, but to be a historian. Now you have a historian. Now you have a picture of yourself with one, just so the audience can see, or if you have it near you, I don't know which one. Um, yeah, whichever, even if you have a picture, I just want them to be able to see it. Well, I, I mean, you can't really see the whole thing, but okay. this is like the only thing I have on me right now. But okay. anyone, look, I'm going to tell you, anyone who goes to um, my YouTube channel, for an example, you'll find me on there playing the chorus somewhere, right? Right, right, right. And, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'll, I'll keep putting this up every once in a while. So just they can go to Bobby right. Storyteller mm -hmm. on YouTube and <laughs> hit subscribe, like all that stuff. Right. But right. Um, the whole point of the instrument was to reclaim some of the things taken from us as ADOS. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the whole point of learning an African language, right, was to reclaim some of the things taken away from us as, as, as ADOS. And the reason why I started working in schools was to access impressionable young minds to show, especially young black brothers who are suffering in our educational system, that there's more to us. Mm -hmm. So when I walk into classrooms, oh man, I, I see young brothers sit up and I mean, it's like. Yeah, if you want to talk about the impact of black male presence, but come on, that's, that's real. So, you're you're attempting to address this. You're expanding. Uh, you're starting to to notice impact. Um, what is the response? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. I'm it's like you. your questions are triggering certain things, mm -hmm. and it's 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 things I've been uncomfortable talking about, but I, I have to now. Mm -hmm. Like if I don't, I'm doing a disservice to our community. If I don't talk about these things. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you this. My model for what I did, yes, it was the West African griot tradition, but mm -hmm. I also relied on people in the past. For example, Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. right? Paul Robeson was inspirational to me because his wealth and fame spread outside of this country first. Mm -hmm. So I was hustling, but in my plan, I always had a plan to go international because I knew if I tried to rely on the confines of contiguous U.S., mm -hmm. I would suffer. Well, let's and let's deal with that. Let's deal with that, because this is something we've talked about, you know, before. Mm -hmm. Had you had you stayed in the U.S. and I'm sure you had people around you urging you to just do that, just focus yeah. on the immediate. Where would your family be in terms of, you know, what you were able to do? Brother, my family would be suffering right now if i had not taken the pains that i took and i'm, I'm going to say this um i evolved as a man as a human being and you helped me with that and i'm not going to let that go right because you've been my brother for a long time mm. and, I, and i'm going to put this out we were sitting one day and mm. you told me this was damn this might have been like 20 years ago damn. you said brother 
you deserve to be loved. And I was like, what does that even look like? Like, what does that mean? You know, I, me asking for something, me expressing what my needs are. What does that even look like? I did not know 20 years ago what that looked like. Well, and you were also, as we all tend to deal with on one level or another, I know I did, um, you know, you were going through a situation where relationship wise, it wasn't reciprocal. Not reciprocal. No, not reciprocal. Okay, yeah. I'm just going to, no, it was one way dynamic. And yeah. so what spawned that conversation was how much we put in, I call it, you know, men's relationship, emotional labor. But the emotional labor we put into relationships that for the most part goes unrecognized. Yes. And from there, it becomes the norm that you continue to pour into it. They continue to receive and you're measured on how well she likes what you pour. But there's no reciprocity. No. And the insanity is this. I remember going and making sure I had a certain amount of life insurance and getting a blood test and get all of those things. Mm -hmm. I was proud of the fact that I was taking care of my family in my right. death. Right. 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 But there was no, I was more proud of that than I was of living. Yeah. Which is insane when you think about it, brother. I mean, think about that. The ultimate sacrifice is to give up your life and make sure everyone else is taken care of. That's, yeah. That's a hell of a mindset. Well, and it's even, it, and that goes back to deserving to be loved. It doesn't even cross our minds. No. That that's something that, you know, that, that reciprocity we're talking about in relationships. So that wasn't something that neither one of us was getting. And, and we were talking really? about that. And from that decision, if you care to share, what did you decide to do? You well, okay. Okay. Um, when I, And I'm going to tell you. The crossroads for me was when I was providing and doing incredible things. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm just going to say it. Right. And I had someone come at me and say, when are you going to get a real job? I was like, what? I'm you, above and beyond. Yeah. You have to understand how mind blowing that was for me, especially from someone that you love. Right. So. I remember in that it, that moment rocked me so much right. that I began to get a lot of clarity in this relationship. And by that time, the kids were a lot older, you know, a couple were off at college. And I still have had goals, right? I wanted to finish my book. I wanted to, you know, I had this book just sitting there. I, I wanted to finish uh, projects. I wanted to open up uh, other countries. Like I had opened up a certain number of countries and I knew I could open up more countries that I would be able to travel to and have relationships with, with governments, with uh, non prop non NGOs, with like, right. But I couldn't do that in the relationship I was in. Okay. And it hurt yeah. when I realized that mm -hmm. because her value system was different than my value system. Mm -hmm. Right. I had even said, we need to get, we can, we can sell this house downsize, put more to the business, do this, do, you know, sell the house. What, why would we, and I was like, look, I can get you a bigger house. Just believe in me. I can mm -hmm. just, I've got this plan. No, every step of the way, it was like a no, no. And it's sort of like that corporate do more with less. Mm -hmm. Right. But the value systems were very different because I was willing to sacrifice for the objectives I had. And mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. our objectives were different. Right. Right. So when, what would you tell people as far as identifying when to leave a situation and, and, and double down on yourself, invest in yourself, knowing full well that breaking away from all that you've grown comfortable with and you yeah. is it, you're going to break away from all of that. What would you say to someone contemplating that now? I, I can, when I say this, this is going to resonate with so many brothers out there. Trust your intuition. Mm -hmm. I would say 99.9% .9 of the brothers out there know. They know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But our conditioning holds us captive. In psychology, they call it classical conditioning, right? 
Mm -hmm. Our conditioning holds us captive. And how we define ourselves as men is a part of that conditioning. Right. 90, I guarantee you, I am not telling any, I'm not breaking any new ground here with this, right? Mm -hmm. Brothers are looking at women right now going, why am I here? <laughs> right? Why do I put up with this? Why do I go through this? Why? 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 Right. right. If you're asking yourself that question, you're in the wrong place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those are not questions we should even be dealing with, brother. Mm -hmm. Look, and I'm going to say this because I've earned the right to say this. I'm in my I'm in my third marriage. Mm -hmm. And each of my marriages was a different developmental stage for me. Right. And I mean, Frederick Douglass had said that was the marriage of my youth. This is the marriage of my adulthood. You know, this is the marriage of my choice. Something like that. He said something like that. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared for the woman that I'm with now. Okay. I wasn't, I, there was no way, shape and form that mm -hmm. I was prepared to meet an incredible woman, beautiful from the inside and out. I, it was like, you know, asking me what my needs are, asking me what can be done for me, meeting, it's like, what do you mean me? Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, that wasn't our training. I, I remember she was cooking for me and I was like, what is her agenda? <laughs> I was like, she was doing all these things. And I'm like, what is her? Well, agenda? well, we almost, we almost had that scene uh, from one of those Tyler Perry movies where, you know, the guy's wife cooks for him and he calls his boy and he's like, she made dinner. <laughs> you that know, was me. That it, was know, me. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was me. Yeah. And not it, only that, but here, here's the other aspect of this. I feel like in my previous relationships, I was a teacher. Okay. I was constantly teaching or I thought I was teaching, mm -hmm. you know, they led me to believe that I was teaching and they were learning. But um, in the, in the relationship I'm in now, I don't have to be someone's teacher because they're fully evolved. So you're, you're, so you're saying though, you had to reach a point before that was even a situation you could yeah. participate in yeah I, I, you had to be willing to break from what wasn't working for you and take a chance on yourself it doesn't even have to do with whether or not you would get married again or any of that you you took a chance on yourself i i took a chance but it was um it was out of necessity mm -hmm. because i had reached a point i was married for 20 years brother i was in a second one I was in my second marriage was 20 years. Yeah. I was in that relationship for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I reached a point where I started seeing these patterns mm. in the relationship. Mm. And I was like, wait a minute, can I do this for another 20 years, 30, 40 years? Am I going to be the one who is proud to say, you know what? We've been married for 50, 60 years. Well, and that's why I bring it up because there are plenty of brothers that do. There is somebody listening right now that's been married for more than 20 years, has been unhappy for a long time, and did not invest in something they intuitionally knew would have been successful. That's the reason I'm bringing this up. It, it wasn't a given. You actually took a chance. Um, and, and, you know, and I remember we, you know, we talked a lot about that during yeah, that time. Yeah. Um, and you transitioned out of it, you know, betting on your, you know, vision. Yes. Betting and, on myself. And so I want to close this out with, you know, something you can you can extend to people who are at that crossroads. You know what I mean? And and you were at that point where you leapt, uh, you jumped into this vision, not knowing if it would be successful, not knowing what was going to happen. The only thing you knew was that it wasn't going to be the same as it had been. Yeah. Some people get real comfortable in 20 years, even 20 years of dysfunction. Some people get comfortable because it's predictable. You know what I mean? It, 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 I know she's going to argue me, with me about this. I know I'm not going to be supported over here, but it's easy. I well, know. We've, also, we've also been sold that's the norm. Yes. We've also been sold, you know, it doesn't matter what woman you get with, you're going to have problems. And right. We've been sold all those things. Sure. But they are like the film over a baby's eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Until you remove them, you don't see anything different. A newborn's baby, a newborn baby, the reality of the film that is over their eyes is their reality mm -hmm. until it's removed. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal each. And I'm, I'm cautious 
I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're asking me. Mm -hmm. I'm cautious because I walked through hell making that decision. Mm -hmm. I walked through hell. Yeah. And I don't want it because now people see me where I'm at. And it's like, oh, wow. You know, that's beautiful. You know, I, I, that's where I want to be. I, but to there get no here, guarantees. yeah, to get here, I yeah. literally walked through hell's fire grappling with myself. I mean, not sleeping for weeks on end and wondering if I made the right decision. And it's it's like to tell someone else to go through that, mm -hmm. to tell someone else, yeah, walk through that. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm cautious in that. It's not so much about telling them to walk through it. it. It's really more what I'm asking you is more about what you learned walking through your fire. Because as we say, there's no guarantees on the outcome. There's no guarantees you're going to become a millionaire if you no. do X, Y, and Z. But there is something to be said for taking a chance on something that you know you need to do, especially if you're in an environment yes. where you're not being supported. And that's, well, that's the jumping off point I'm interested in at this point. I understand completely. So I'm going to say this, and I hope this resonates with other brothers out there. The that whole point of believing in yourself may, I know how that sounds, right? Mm -hmm. But there truly is a, a path, mm -hmm. a purpose. And I think we've been sold this like idea by others that uh, the path is bountiful and fruitful and there are all these things and you know, all you have, it's so easy that life is easy and you can walk through and you can have all these things, but we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. We know anything you get in this life, you are going to work for it. Wasn't it Douglas who said, I may not get everything I work for, but I'll definitely work for everything I get. Right. Mm -hmm. So believing in yourself is one key. The second is this, right? People are showing you who they are. Yes you are refusing to believe right that's that is a key right there yeah and i would not and and i've I, I think i've seen women do this and they do this artfully when they decide to leave someone they don't walk out the door no they make a plan mm -hmm. <laughs> and that plan uh i've 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 worked in corporate with this i've worked in the community with this that plan may take a year two years Mm -hmm. They know they're going to leave. Oh, yeah. But the other person doesn't. Yeah. She will even fight you to stay until she's ready to leave when she's ready to leave. And when she's ready to leave, it'll happen. Right. Once her plan is, it, it, you know, once that nest on the other side of town, I think Tyler Perry made that analogy once. She'll make a nest on another part of town, <laughs> figuratively speaking, and she'll right. stay with you until it's ready. And when she's ready, she's out. But that's that's actually. Oh, go ahead. No, but men don't typically do that. No. Men walk out the door, right? I'm pissed. I'm done. I'm out. And we walk out and we suffer whatever consequences are because we feel like I'm a man. I'm just going to make this happen. I'm going to do this. Plan. Right. right. Plan. Try to make it work until you can't make it work anymore. And when you can't make it work. But see, that's, that's one of the things, though, I appreciated about your transition out of that. Because you not only invested in yourself in terms of your vision, in terms of business, but you you did the same in relationships. And, and basically, one of the things you did is the way you dated after that second marriage. Oh, you, know, you would have never done prior in your life. You actually yeah. went into situations saying, this is what I'm this is my, what I'm requiring. This is yeah. what I bring to the table. This is what you need to bring. Oh, you can't do it. Nice meeting you. Peace. Move we on. talked about that. Part yeah. of that is knowing who you are, though, because yeah. I had to figure out who the hell I was. Exactly. Know what my needs were. Right. And I had to be uncompromising, yes. unapologetic yes. in making sure that my needs were met. But I could be that way because I was conditioned to meet the needs of others. Yes. I was already yes. conditioned to meet everyone else. Uh, yes. Any woman I was with was going to get a 125%. Right. But I did not know what I needed. Well, and you didn't. We did, we were not taught to value that 125 percent. We were taught that it really wasn't that much that we bring. 
And when you actually step right. back and realize what we were taught to give as a default Ooh. is so much higher than what others have been considered. And you learn to value that. See, and that's yes. the thing you, you learn to do. You learn to value what you brought. What age were you oh. when you left that second marriage? Wow, brother. I was in my mid 40s. Okay. I was so, in my mid 40s before I discovered that the door was open. <laughs> The like all I had to do was walk through it yeah. to a better life, to a different life, to achieving the things that I envisioned I could achieve. I mean, I was already achieving, but mm -hmm. I wanted to go next level. But that's and I needed someone with me. But that's the crux of what I'm getting at today. You could have stayed. I could have could have been within a situation that it was familiar. I could have bad. We all we 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 know that crossroad. You could have stayed, it's familiar. You could have left it at that, but you took a chance on a vision. You followed through on it. You appreciated your worth and value in terms of how you come to the table in a dynamic and a relationship and in terms of business. Because yeah. at the same time that you're saying to, you know, these, you know, these various women that you're dating, this is what I require. You're doing the same thing in terms of your business. You are starting to expand how you engage. You negotiated your rates and and the kind of services you were offering and, and open you know, up the international markets and international. all of those things. Yeah. So you're going to whole other countries and you're speaking languages that nobody's expecting an African-American man to speak. You would tell me, you would call me and tell me stories <laughs> about how people would be talking shit around you. Yeah. In other countries not realizing you're fluent. Yeah. Even in the African languages, even in the African languages, but African languages, French, Spanish, all of it, you know, you're sitting there fluent, listening to them talk shit about you. It, it, there's so much of that that has happened. I have so many, I need to write another book about <laughs> all of those moments, boy. Yeah. But let me add this because I want to give props where props are due. Because I met a woman, my th this is my third wife, who, when we sat down to talk, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I I was challenging, but she didn't have a knee-jerk reaction to the way that I was challenging. Mm -hmm. She actually looked at me and said, because I remember I asked, one of the key questions I asked was, I said, here's what I need in a relationship with a woman to mm -hmm. feel more like a man. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and said, what do you need from your man in a relationship that helps you feel more like a woman? Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, I've never thought of that. Never been asked. Either. She said, I'm going to need a little time. Mm -hmm. Right. And I never met a woman who processed like that. And mm -hmm. she went away. We came back together. We had deeper discussions. She had questions for me. We went away. We, we challenged each other mentally. Mm -hmm. Right. And I had never had that before. I had never had a woman who would acquiesce in a moment to say, I don't understand and, or even be apologetic for, it was like- Or to be I'm vulnerable not, and to allow- vulnerable. vulnerable, that's what I'm looking for. To be yes. vulnerable like that. I, yes. I had never experienced that before. So um, that helped me. Like I wasn't planning on being married, brother. I, I was like, two marriages, I'm done. Mm -hmm. My focus was gonna be my business. I had even planned on moving to Africa. I was going to move to Africa and stay in Africa for a while. But man, when you get with the white, the right one, when you get listen, with the right one. Listen to this. This is written in by Greg Wilson. He says, uh, I think us staying together did more harm to my son than it would have if we just went our separate ways. But I saw my father stick it out. So that's what I thought manhood was about. And see, this is why the transition point, the crossroads, when you leapt into uncertainty and then laid out priorities, laid out plans, and anybody business-wise or intimately that came mm -hmm. in your space, and I remember this time period for you, you laid out, this is what this is how it goes. If you're if you're in my space, this is what you bring, this is what I bring. If you can't get down with that, peace. Yeah, no hard feelings. And that None was whatsoever. And I remember coming to visit you during that transition. You had an apartment, beautiful, you know, little spot. And when I went in there, the first thing I noticed was absolute quiet and peace. And I remember we had a discussion one morning. You were sitting yeah. at your desk, relaxing, and, you know, you had your computer open. You were doing a little bit of work. 
but I had never quite seen you that peaceful and that relaxed. And, and so I'm, I'm just interjecting that before we transition out, because I think it was an important part. And I don't know if you want to comment on peace and what role that played during that transition. That was what every, this, look, this is what every man desires. I'm going to tell you, men don't desire riches, wealth, conquering in the world. Men desire peace of mind. That's what we desire. All of those things that it, on the appearance, it looks like what we're chasing, the wealth, you know, conquering, whatever, is to achieve those moments of peace of mind. That's You can down, and I'll go 100% on this. You talk to any man, talk to any brother. That's all we want. We just want peace of mind. Now, I set my space up like that on purpose for me. And I was not about to have it disrupted by mm -hmm. anyone. That's why I know at that time I seemed really uncompromising, but I had been married for 20 years. I had committed my life and whatever is left of my life is going to be lived mm -hmm. the way that I want to live it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, and I know my worth. I know my value, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to be willing to admit when others didn't see it. Yeah. I, I had a teacher in West Africa, a brother who was teaching me the griot tradition to play mm -hmm. the kora. His name was uh, Buba Sissoko, Bubakar Sissoko. And he spoke Wolof, he spoke Mandinka, but he, we were sitting one night beneath, and it was this huge moon. And Buba said, go where you're accepted. <laughs> right. go, and where you're not accepted, don't go there. Yes, sir. Because he was talking about me playing the kora and doing the storytelling. Mm -hmm. But it hit me, right? Because I run into places now where I'm not accepted. Mm -hmm. I, I run into people, like I'm wearing African attire. I got this instrument. I, I know how I look. I Look, but I have people like making faces and looking sideways. And it's like, they'll hear me starting to speak to African. And I'm talking about people in our community. I'm not talking about, mm -hmm. you know, I think people think I'm talking about white folks. I'm not talking about white folks, right? But the whole point is, as soon as I hit that, I'm gone. Well, because there are other doors opening. There are other places. There are other ways of acceptance. But let's also be clear, too, when you talk about that kind of bias that you experience, there's a gender component to that, too. You've come into those places and you've had black women storytellers treat you with disdain. And, 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 and you don't have to go into any, you know, yeah. depth of that if you don't choose to. But I'm saying as your friend and, and as a witness, I've seen you have to navigate the types of, of low level uh, contempt in regard to even just your occupation. We're not even talking about girlfriends, ex girl We're not even talking about that. We're talking about yeah. in a work dynamic in your field, non-traditional as it is. Not in a corporate space. We've, we've had those conversations. Men are commenting on some of my last videos about the workplace and the type of discrimination they've experienced. You've experienced, experienced this in an independent storytelling space where the contempt for you as a black male in these spaces was palpable. And I'm going to say it if you can't. No. You've been through that. And and, and it, it came out of the blue, especially when you come out of a context the way we did you know, the nationalist context of raising up community yeah. to have that yeah. like, level of hostility. And you're like, you know what I mean? It, you, like you know. where it's irrational. It's irrational. You Okay, here. You would think, okay, you would think that a brother who goes out and proves himself. Right. That a brother comes back and is mastering. I mean, I'm not talking about learning. I'm saying mastering five languages. Mm -hmm. learns the griot tradition in West Africa, brings it back to African-Americans here, not only learns the tradition, but learns the nuances of it, makes the connection and bridges the gap between ADOS, what happened there, what here, and does the research and comes in with the oral history and is steep. You would think, right, that that brother would be accepted with open arms. You would think, yeah. right? But the disdain, um, it's almost like, and I'm not just saying sisters, because it does happen there also, right? It has happened there also, but this uppity, or you think highly of yourself, or you think more of yourself, 
And then we, as men, go, wait, wait, no, I don't. No, wait. I, and now I'm at the point where, like, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Because I've put in the work. Mm -hmm. And when I've put in the work and you haven't, the problem isn't with me. The problem is with you. Mm -hmm. Right? And we've never been willing to say that. That disdain. Like, I've, I've walked into spaces and, but like, do I know you? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, we have the same profession, but did I cross you sometimes? Or, you know, do I owe you child support? <laughs> like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. That low-level contempt. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I honestly don't. But I'm not willing to deal with it. Because if I'm in, I'm invited all over the world. I've got governments, brother, inviting me places that I never imagined I would be. Now I have a reputation. I don't even promote. I don't do all the things I used to do when I was younger. I don't have to do that anymore, right? I'm known. I may yeah. not be known in this country, right? But I'm known globally outside of this country because of the, the languages and because of what I've put in. So you know, I'm... I'm not tripping on those things right now. I'm really not. Ernest Smith says, this is an amazing topic. I myself stayed in a bad marriage for 20 years just for my daughters. But now this may be, it may have been the worst thing I ever did, but I uh, put my personal needs aside for family. Yeah. And, and that was a mistake I, I made. They are not personal needs. Mm -hmm. They are not personal needs. Your daughters need to see the whole you that is inclusive of who you are as a man. They, yes, those sir. are personal needs. Yes, sir. Those are the purpose of your living. It, it is a brother who would say that. I know I, I've spoken that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you, those are not personal needs. Mm -hmm. It is a need to live purpose because we inspire our children much more. I, I know brothers right now who sacrificed for their children and their children hate them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because they did not, they did not sacrifice in the way they knew they needed to. They sacrificed in the way someone else told them they needed to sacrifice. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Think about this. We, I mean, we. Had, I, there's a brother I know who left so much money on the table that he is suffering right now mm. because he did what he thought was right by sacrificing for his children. But what mm -hmm. did it mean to sacrifice? Yeah, for your children. Yeah. You, like mine was sacrificing life, soul, and body, because that's what it meant to be a man. It is not what it means to be a man. At least my definition. I'm not going to say what anybody else's definition needs to be, but it is not mine. Mine, we inspire one another. That's right. I appreciate, and I'm sorry I held you longer than we had planned, but I appreciate you coming. We through. we always do that, brother. Every time we get on the phone, we. <laughs> But, you know, shout out to you. Shout out to those who, who listen. Please like, share, support, uh, you know, subscribe. Go to go to Bob the Storyteller. Uh, check out his YouTube channel. You can check out his website. I think it's BobTheStoryteller.com. Yeah. Right. You can yeah. go ahead and pick up the book, Road uh, to Ash and Dust. There it is. Yeah. And uh, check him out. Um, and again, appreciate y'all coming through. So let me go ahead. Uh, I'm going to pull you down. Anything you want to say before you close out? No, I, all I want to say is, look, Dr. Johnson, I'm going to call you Dr. Johnson here because um, you have been an inspiration to me and you are a huge reason why I have, there's a lot of other brothers also who I've relied on. But in our conversations over the 20 something years, brother, you don't know what a profound influence you have been on my life. And I'm just grateful that others out there get to have the same influence in their lives. So props to you and everything you're doing. And I'm always going to be here when you call. Always, Amen. brother. So I, I, blessings. I appreciate that. I appreciate you, good brother. Uh, hold tight one second. So let me pull you down. Um, but uh, Shout out to him. Appreciate y'all listening. I uh, look forward to hearing your responses in the comment section. And y'all have a good one. Peace.